Dr. George Fonnells. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gosh, what, what a warm welcome, if only clinics are like this. Um, it, it's very, very kind of you to invite me to give the talk. Uh, as a bit of background, I'm a haematology consultant here in Cambridge. I have been around the country for my training. I went from Oxford, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Leeds. In Leeds, I did my PhD and... Oh, sorry. There we go. Gosh, my wife tells me I have a booming voice. That's, it's rare for me to be asked to speak louder. Um, so I, in Leeds, I did my PhD and registrar training with Pete Hillman, who some of you may know is quite prominent in the world of CLL. And then 2004, moved down to Cambridge. Initially, I was here on a university contract, but moved back into the NHS. And thank you. And set up our CLL clinic in Cambridge in 2006. So yes, 2005, 2006. So time passes. Um, and the last four years, I chaired the UK CLL Forum, which I've now handed over to Anna Shu from Oxford, who's doing a fantastic job there. So when, when I'm asked to speak to a patient group, of course, within this group, there's a huge uh, different degree of experience about CLL, from people who are fairly new to the world to people who are genuine experts. And um, I, I must say, I love the expert patients. They're always, uh, there's a good cohort from Cambridge, and I'm looking around the room, uh, <laughs> finding my experts who, who are as up to speed on the conference data as I am. I've even put my very last animation is something that's three days old, and I bet that beats my Cambridge patients. And well, maybe not all of them. But anyway, so I'm going to do a bit of an overview as to what CLL is. Um, I'm going to walk through standard therapies, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the new therapies. And there are areas I'm not touching, but I think if I get the message right, I've got till, till half 12. It's a long time to listen to one person. Um, but we've got till half 12, so there's a lot of time and definitely to take uh, discussion from the floor and questions and all sorts of open debate. Do feel free to put me on the spot. So what actually is leukaemia? So we're talking about chronic lymphocytic leukaemia today. Of course, in the broadest terms, leukaemia is a cancer of white blood cells, without stating the obvious. We know from a lot of science... Oh, that's not a pointer. Where's my pointer? There we go. That right in the middle of our marrow, we have these pluripotent stem cells. These are the mother cells that are regenerating our blood all the time. And it is remarkable, if you look at the numbers of times these cells, they live in the marrow all our life, and they divide and set off this amazing series of divisions and amplifications. Billions of new cells have to be made a day in the bone marrow. It's remarkable that all human beings don't die of blood cancer within you know, days of being born, because the marrow is so active, turning over, dividing. And we know that cancer is a mistake of the DNA, a problem where things go wrong. So it's remarkable the actual mechanisms that have to be in place to allow this repeated huge amounts of cell division to go on to make our blood. And so these mother cells, they divide every now and again to renew themselves, of course, and then they go down what we call the myeloid lineage, and these are where you get your red cells, your platelets, neutrophils, eosinophils, and then off into the lymphoid lineage. So in, uh, now. So if we're being simplistic and we're saying, well, look, what are the myeloid leukemias and what are the lymphoid leukemias? It's just really describing the type of cell that is affected. Because we throw these terms around, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, but what actually cells does it mean? And the acute leukemias are when early stage cells, so right down closer towards the stem cell, go wrong and they pick up genetic abnormalities and expand rapidly in the bone marrow. They pack out the bone marrow within weeks to a month. And the acute leukemias without treatment are almost invariably fatal within a month or two. And these are very different from the chronic leukemias. So the acute lymphoblastic, that's the commonest childhood leukemia, and acute myeloid leukemia is much more common as adults age. The chronic leukemias are quite different because the chronic leukemias build over time. And these are leukemias of the more mature cells. So chronic myeloid leukemia is 
pretty rare. There are about 600 new cases a year in the UK. And patients present with a growing spleen, often not too unwell, but gradually become anemic and sometimes get problems from very high numbers of white cells here. The chronic myeloid leukemias respond incredibly well to this specific kinase inhibitor called amatinib, and that's completely changed how those leukemias are managed. The chronic lymphoid leukemias are dominated by leukemias of the B cell, and of course CLL, by far and away the commonest of all of these. There are rarities around the edges, hairy cell leukemia, there's a T cell, LGL leukemia, there are all sorts of rarities that you'll come across in your reading, but by far and away CLL dominates the picture. So CLL, what is it that we know about CLL? It is the commonest leukemia in the Western world, without doubt. It represents this accumulation of those more mature B cells. Just to remind you, actually I just realized I didn't talk about lymphocytes and myeloid. Hmm, maybe I should. The lymphocytes are the clever part of the immune system and the blood system. The B lymphocytes make the antibodies. Through evolution, we've moved from having this simple myeloid immunity where those neutrophils and monocytes, they come out and attack any bug there is. And we've evolved these clever lymphocytes that make special immune responses and they allow us to fight off new bugs and new viruses. And that's what will probably save the human race if some new terrible virus comes from outer space and some Orwellian thing happens because of this amazing unpredictable variability of our immune response that somewhere out there in the billions on the planet there will be people who are making, will be able to make immune responses to any combination of attack. And that's this cleverness of the, the lymphoid series, the B cells and the T cells. So in CLL, it's these mature B cells that have gone wrong and they're growing in the marrow. And they accumulate in the blood, the bone marrow, lymph nodes and spleen. And that actually reflects how different the patients can be. Because you can have some patients who never get lymph node enlargement. They may just have blood and bone marrow, sometimes a bit of spleen. And the other end of the spectrum, you can get patients whose CLL cells just accumulate in the lymph nodes. And actually, we call those a different name. We call those small lymphocytic lymphoma, SLL. But actually, it's the same disease. It's just that the cell proteins on the surface of those cells say, hang on, I want to live in a lymph node rather than I want to live in the bone marrow. That's something you may well have come across in your reading. But, so we tend to think of CLL as divided between these compartments. Most typical CLL patients have everything that's involved. So bone marrow, blood, lymph nodes, and they tend to have spleens that enlarge as time passes. These B cells have these special characteristics, and you may have come across in your reading these terminology when people talk about CD5 positive, 23 positive. They are just a protein code that says to doctors and specialists like me, well, you know what, I'm more likely to be CLL than hairy cell leukemia or mantle cell lymphoma or follicular lymphoma because all of these conditions are related and it seems a bit complicated from the outset but in some ways it's good because it means someone like me has a job because all I see is lymphoma and CLL so a bit of complexity there separating them out means that I have something to do for a job but they are, they are all different, they all have these different protein codes on the surface. And CD5 is just a classification. Somebody had to come up with a name or a number code for what a particular antibody recognises. So we can then classify them and say, aha, you've got lots of B cells, they're CD5 positive, 23 positive, weak CD20, highly likely to be CLL. So what about the typical patient? I'm going to keep talking. Please interrupt me if at any stage someone has a question. Please. So... What is a typical CLL patient? Well, the typical presentation is around 70. Perhaps it's getting a bit earlier because a lot of patients are diagnosed by chance when they just have a blood test or for another reason. And uh, medics, we can't resist doing blood checks. If you turn up for your hypertension check, you'll get a blood test. Or, uh, you know, itchy left ear, someone will do a blood test and they find a diagnosis uh, of CLL. It's a bit more common in males. And it is more common in people who have a first-degree relative. Now, this causes a lot of stress, of course, because familial CLL is quite different. There are some families that are 
clearly very unfortunate and collect CLL. And we've been doing various mapping. I've been involved with the, the chaps down at the Marsden and map some very specific genetic defects that can be inherited. But the vast majority of risk within families is what we call polygenomic inheritance. It's a little bit of risk from there, a little bit of risk from there. So this is not classic Mendelian genetics. With I don't want to sound complicated, but the classic thing, you've got it, your child's got a one in two chance, or if it's a recessive gene and there are two of you, then your child's got a one in four. No, it's not that type of thing at all. It's a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And you've got to be really difficult with how you throw around statistics, because if I pluck a number out of the air and say, well, a human being's got a one in 2,000 risk of a disease, whether it's CLL or not, Four times, it sounds really bad if you say, gosh, your relative has a four times higher risk, but four times higher might be one in 500 <laughs> lifetime risk. You've got to be careful how you throw these things around. There was that terrible phase with journalism when people say, well, the oral contraceptive pill triples your risk of having a thrombosis in a young woman. In, in a young woman. So across the board, people stop taking the pill and loads of un unwanted pregnancies. Of course, pregnancy has a dramatically higher chance of increasing your risk of thrombosis. And so that is classic Daily Mail journalism. You throw things around, you frighten people, and instead of saying your chance of having a clock goes from one in 200,000, actually, that's going to make my maths hard, one in 210,000 to one in 70,000, which is real what triple means in that circumstance. So quite a different question. So I'll, I'll repeat the question to the floor so everyone heard. So the question is, if, if I or my, my relative has a family history of other cancers, do these things compound? Does it make them have a higher risk of other cancers, a higher risk of CLL? We don't have that data. We know that if you have a lymphoproliferative disorder, so lymphoma, myeloma, CLL, Hodgkin's, if you look at big data spaces, undoubtedly there is increased familial risk. So if you have a relative who has Hodgkin's, then your chance of having CLL is slightly higher. And it's probably all wrapped up in this complexity of the immune system and how you fight off cancers. There is not, that I'm aware of, an, a link to other non-lymphoid cancers. Of course, other cancers are higher risk for patients with CLL. That's something I haven't included in this talk, but that's a separate question. Unfortunately, because CLL is a disease of immune failure, gradually over the years, that the immune system is key to surveying, keeping an eye out for other cancers. So the, the risk is slightly higher across the board. Other question? Uh, that's a very good question, which I can't answer. <laughs> no, no, good. I, I, I genuinely can't say. I could hand wave something about the Y chromosome, but it would just be rubbish, so I won't, I won't guess. So as we know, many patients are found coincidentally. You've got the well man clinic, the well woman clinic, tests for other conditions. Um, I mean, the classic is the chap... The bloke, he's a businessman, he finally retires at 65, he's never been to the GP, his wife says, you're going to have your blood check, you're going to have your well man clinic, and they turn around and they find CLL. So that happens, comes up to my clinic, of course, repeatedly. Um, is that a good or a bad thing? We'll touch on that. Um, because particularly these patients diagnosed coincidentally, often they are very well, and it can be a really life-changing sort of... Um, door closing in your face, patients have to transition 
through a period of time. It can take four months, six months. I always say to my patients, look, it is a period of time you've got to go through. Two weeks ago, you didn't know someone like me. You didn't even know what the word leukemia was, or you thought about children in Great Ormond Street in bubbles or something. Uh, and suddenly, this is right on your doorstep. And it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging transition time to go through. I did just have to put monoclonal B lymphocytosis, MBL, because MBL is a good example of how doctors are great at making people who are well, ill. <laughs> so I, I listen to the news and I hear all of these things and how the, the more tests you do on people, particularly aging people, aging people have things that change. Um, that's part of the natural life cycle and you find things. And actually, if you look careful, as the human being ages, it's almost a natural tendency to start getting failures of your blood system. You lose the diversity of your repertoires. Small CLL-like clones can start to grow up. You can start making things called paraproteins, which are immunoglobulins secreted in the blood, which shouldn't be there. But actually, if you're over 80, well, 5 Eight, 10% even of patients might have these abnormalities in the blood if you look carefully. Are they ill or are they just healthy people over 80? But we're very good at labelling people. Is there any effect the Ah, so that's a different question. Is there something that you do in the way that if you smoke, you get lung cancer, if you drink, you get liver cancer? Has, is there anything that somebody does to get CLL? No. I say that across the board to people. We're going to talk a little bit about vitamin D and things and things, but actually I'm going to say no. What about the severe virus reaction? Yeah, so... So that's another one of these classic chicken and eggs and what's there first. Did you get the serious virus because actually in your marrow you had CLL which reflects a degree of immune failure so you didn't clear it so you got ill so then the CLL arose. Was the CLL sat there in the marrow because nobody would know. And it's actually very hard with CLL to prove cases are driven by viral infection. In some of the other lymphomas we categorically can show that hepatitis C, Epstein-Barr virus, there are good examples where viral infections can trigger loss of immune regulation and driving a cancer to expand. But CLL, it's always been very difficult. But undoubtedly, you know, one or two, three patients a year I'll have come to me and say, look, I was completely well, I was really ill, I was on holiday, I was laid flat, had flu, and I've come back and now I've got CLL. And they're convinced that one was causal to the other, but you never really know. What about the Yeah. So let me take that from the microphone. So the question is raised is if you have a chronic bacterial infection, can that drive deregulation and expansion of CLL? So w without getting too stuck into the origin debates of CLL, there's a lot of debate as to whether people are genetically predisposed and then they get exposure to a common antigen, these things called super antigens or an everyday viral bacteria, or an autoantigen where for reasons and possibly infection expose a bit of your body that wasn't previously exposed and that acts as a trigger but we really don't know for sure at all it is clear that some of the lymphoproliferative disorders 
not really typically CLL, but have been clearly linked to people getting chronic infections. And a great example is the marginal zone lymphomas. These are all cousins of CLL, where you can actually show, yes, an infection in the eye or an infection in the stomach has driven CLL. But um, I don't... I obviously don't want to have a, a debate from the stand about an individual case, and I agree there are certain individuals who are convinced that infection has driven and caused, but let me reassure you from a literature base, that is not a, an overriding cause of CLL. Are you aware of the CLL trial of the Yeah, so that, that's the, the clear trial that we've been running in the UK, and I'm also aware of the results. Yeah. So. Yeah, Steve Devereux, my good friend and colleague in King's, who's run that. And yeah, good. Next question. Yeah, so the question from the floor there was, how about the environment and all of the things that we're exposed to? I simply can't answer that question. I hear what you're saying. In things like hairy cell leukemia, it does seem serious, significantly more common in rural populations, in gardeners and things. But hairy cell leukemia, one in a million patients, one in a million people get this. So, you know, keep your secateurs active. Don't stop going out and doing the roses. But uh, you just can't, you can't categorically say. I mean, it's like the bacterial argument. I'm not in any way saying no at all. And there are some individuals who are absolutely convinced of one thing that may have driven it. I think we just have to say from big population studies, these things are quite hard to prove. But I, I agree. If I go running in the fields near us in Falmia and their farmers are out spraying, um, well, I try not to breathe and get blue and slow down. I don't like the idea of those things either. Right, so we'll keep moving. Uh, but, so, we've talked about this benign uh, aspect of CLL, but you don't really know when you first meet a patient whether you're going to have a patient who's going to follow this very benign path or a patient that's going to follow a much more aggressive path. Because it, it can be a very different disease between individuals. Now systemic symptoms, tiredness, weight loss, night sweats. These are things that your clinicians will be asking you every clinic. And sometimes they really are striking. Tiredness, so difficult to um, pin that one down. Because what do we know about tiredness? Um, people probably do get more tired as they get older. So you've probably got this baseline of becoming more tired. Um, having said that, that's quite a hard one to quantify categorically CLL increases lethargy. Years of running a CLL clinic, it's absolutely clear that some CLL patients, well, I'd say many CLL patients, feel more tired than you'd expect from an age match, healthy control. At the other end of the spectrum, some CLL patients get profoundly tired. And um, as I look around the room, I had one patient here who was recounting, he'd get to the end of his day, just go to bed, and had been sleeping 12, 13 hour days and we talked about this over the clinics and saying you know that isn't normal for someone who's 55 to come home from work, be so shattered, go to bed, wake up the next day. That is clearly pathological lethargy. But it's very difficult because patients naturally are nervous about chemotherapy and if somebody is suffering tiredness as a main symptom and you're going to say well we're going to give you chemotherapy to improve your tiredness. Well, that seems a bit difficult, particularly as many of you in this room would have had experience with chemotherapy. But if you are tired, tired's the wrong word, profoundly lethargic because of your disease, and you successfully treat the disease, then there are so many examples in my clinic of people who, it's almost the Lazarus Act, they rediscover their energy and suddenly they've got time in the evenings. People say, gosh, yeah, I can watch films now. I've even been out. And, and people, because it can creep up on people over years, haven't realised they're just slowing up and their life has changed and they've just taken it for granted that they don't do things. And I often try and compare it to things like a chest infection. If you've got a bug in your lungs and you're feeling rubbish, you take antibiotics and you expect you're going to feel better. 
And in many ways, it's like that with CLL. If you have active CLL that is making you unwell and you're treated, we hope you will feel better. Of course, the treatments are not the same as taking some comoxiclap for a week. Uh, so it's a, that's where the analogy stops. But it's good to think about that as a concept, that the disease makes you unwell and you can respond very well to treatment. And it's the same, of course, with weight loss. And night sweats, gosh, I feel so sorry for some of my patients with night sweats when they are getting up and they have to change the sheets and it interrupts their sleep cycle. It means people move out into spare rooms. And it it's really, really does impact on people's quality of life. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing that we've never really been able to explain, that almost certainly night sweats are driven by these different cytokines. It's the body, part of the body's response. If you get influenza or tuberculosis, it's a very typical thing, isn't it? People can get sweats at night. And night sweats are the biggest nightmare for general practice. Well, one of the many, many nightmares for general practice. And one of the reasons is because night sweats can be a very everyday part of life. They can be part of the change of life with women. And you can get the night sweat if you've, I don't know, changed your diet, eaten some spicy food, sometimes alcohol or changing the alcohol. And all sorts of things can trigger a night sweat. But why it happens at night, I can't specifically answer. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We've definitely got the dental message. <laughs> the first patient <laughs> will get you involved in the vitamin D discussion as it comes as well. So bone marrow failure. CLL can gradually eat away at the bone marrow because the cells get packed out and then the bone marrow, remember at the beginning I showed you that uh, the bone marrow makes the red cells, the, the neutrophils, the platelets and as the CLL expands there's less space for normal production. So imagine a factory with all the workers trying to produce their red cells and you've just got things sitting there. We tend to think it could be wrong of CLL sitting there in a fairly benign way just packing out the marrow and stopping it working. But patients gradually become anemic and pick up infections and bleeding. Of course, lymph nodes enlarge. That, as I said at the beginning, is so variable between patients. Some patients end up with really big, chunky lymph nodes. Some people are very tolerant of that. Other people aren't. Some people get discomfort in the lymph nodes. And certainly CLL patients who get viral infections can get transient enlargement of lymph nodes that can become quite tight and painful. Other things, sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed mosquito bites as people develop CLL. They develop these strange reactions to mosquito bites they never had. Sometimes a mosquito bite can make the groin lymph nodes inflamed. It's all of this disordered immune system that comes with CLL. Spleens. Spleens in CLL, thankfully, normally aren't too painful, but you can infarct the spleen from time to time. The spleen can become so bulky, it pushes on the stomach so you can't eat properly. It stops people bending over, uh, doing up shoelaces, all sort of things like that which can affect people's quality of life significantly. And then recurrent infections. We know that a hallmark of CLL is recurrent infections. Chest and sinuses tend to be much more dominant compared with skin or gastrointestinal tract. And part of that reflects this immune failure, the gradual loss of the immunoglobulins. These are the proteins secreted in the blood that end up going into the sinuses and the mucous membranes and the lungs, which are a key part of first defense. And we know that that actually creeps up on patients relatively early, even in early stage CLL, have a slightly higher incidence of all these infections. Then the other thing is autoimmune manifestation. So we know as part of this immune deregulation, CLL patients can suffer hemolytic anemia, ITP occasionally autoimmune bullous skin reactions and all sorts of things can happen with CLL because it is the immune system not working properly so it can start attacking itself. So of course 
That's a very, actually, it's very good, the questions you get from a patient group. They are different from my scientific colleagues, because I guess it's everyone approaches things differently. Um, so we worry about asymmetric growth, because all of us have that slight fear of Richter's transformation in the back of your mind, which we'll come on to. So particularly a patient who has had long-term, small to moderate-sized lymphadenopathy, and then one side gets bigger. And in my practice, I would definitely biopsy that. Um, but you are right, you get the occasional patient who over years will have a more dominant left side than the right side. Again, no explanation for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it's been like that for a long time, then that's just the way you are. Uh, I think if things change suddenly, then that's when you'd probably start thinking. So the course of CLL, well, there are all sorts of different courses that we can map out. So this is time along that axis, ooh, went back. And so you have these slow progressors, you get people who from the beginning just uh, have much more aggressive disease. Others can sit there and suddenly transform even before therapy, and thankfully not very common. Others can just not do very much for decades, and then you say, is that a disease at all? <coughs> so, when a new patient comes in, I think this variability between individuals really does make it quite challenging because if you're managing someone with acute leukemia, it's really tough and awful, but you can have a very clear conversation with them as to what has to happen and what will happen. With CLL, that's very different. If you're in your 70s with newly diagnosed CLL, then it's highly likely, statistically, not from a hunch, it's just statistically highly likely, likely that CLL will not shorten your life. How long have I got, Doc? It's the type of question when people think we're going to make it easy and they say, look, don't faff around, just how long have I got, Doc? And you say, look, I would love to, I would love to be able to say to you, I want to be honest with you, or, you know, I'm running my own company, uh, I've got to make decisions, so how long till first treatment and how long till I die? And you say, I, I just can't say that to you because it's so variable. Of course, we build up pictures as we go along. And then, will CLL make me unwell is the bottom one. And that, of course, is a very, very sensible question when patients come in and say, I feel well at the moment, what's going to happen to me? And these are ooh, the things that we have to explore with our patients. So trying to make predictions up front takes us into this territory of prognostic markers. Now, prognostic markers are useful, they are stress-inducing, and they're predictive for populations. You've got to remember that how a prognostic marker applies to you as an individual is sometimes quite challenging to work out. And I think that's an important thing for you always to discuss with your clinicians, particularly if you're getting worried about <laughs> prognostic markers, which we'll talk about. Um, but we know that in population terms, some of these prognostic markers can say, yes, if you have 100 people with this abnormality, maybe only 20 of them will still be off treatment in 10 years. If you have 100 people with that abnormality, maybe 80 of them still won't be treated at 10 years. So huge difference. But of course, as an individual, you simply can't say where you are going to be in that grouping. And that's always the challenge with prognostic markers. They are predominantly based on population grouping. And is it a good or bad thing to know that? And that depends on your character, depends on where you are in life. And I think that is one of the important skills of a CLL clinician, to make sure they get to know the patient and work out what is right for them. If you are a 55-year-old self-employed businessman, and you want to know, gee, should you round up, you know, close your business, blah, 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 it might be different from 70-year-old woman who's actually well in herself and she's not particularly interested in leukemia science she simply doesn't want to know. And that really uh, spans the spectrum. Some people like to know every last detail of the disease and we used to, um, we used to say look there's really n little to be gained doing things up front. I, I have become much more flexible with that in my clinic. Um, we are rewriting the national guidelines, so I can't say exactly how we're going to phrase it in the guidelines, but I personally am a bit more flexible at doing prognostic markers, particularly if patients want them. So, clinical stage. In terms of prognostic markers, we can just talk you through some of, I think I may have lost the slide, I've got my order wrong. Oh yeah, slightly out of order, because prognostic markers, uh, uh, the traditional prognostic markers from 
way back, remember these are old survival figures, so don't look at the actual numbers, but this is the original Rai stage and Binet stage. And that was the simplistic thing saying, if you have more advanced disease, you are likely to live less long. Now that is really quite straightforward, we'd all understand that logic. That if you've only got a little bit of disease, i.e. your lymphocytes aren't up particularly high, or lymphadenopathy, or not very much, but if you become anemic or your platelets are low, then you're more likely to have advanced disease. And please remember, a, a two-year survival for stage CCLL we simply would not recognise nowadays. That's very old data. But clinical stage is still an important thing. But there are lots of newer prognostic markers, and there's a lot of debate as to how we use them in the clinic. Can you use prognostic markers to say, well, this are particularly bad, we'll give you this treatment, and these are particularly good, we'll give you that treatment. And that division has started to happen in CLL. It's starting to happen in other cancers as well, particularly as we bring in more understanding of the molecular biology and the genetics into the clinic. So there are so many, I put rather flippantly here, every ASH conference, that's the American Society of Hematology that we troop off to in the States to uh, get a, an injection of CLL deep uh, knowledge every year, and contributes, of course, from the UK. Uh, but I've put another 30. There are all sorts of ways you can crawl over CLL in terms of the molecular biology, the protein expression, the environment the cells live in, to actually try and piece together and subgroup CLL patients. But the three most commonly used and uh, important at the moment are the chromosomal abnormalities. So this is what we call fish testing fluorescence, in situ, hybridization, translated, that means in the lab, they are using specific probes for bits of your chromosomes and take your CLL cells under the microscope and stick on a labeled probe and they look and say, aha, are we missing bits of your chromosomes? <coughs> so Q is the long arm, P stands for petite is the uh, short arm. So Del 17P, that means you're missing a bit of the short arm of chromosome 17 in your leukemia. 11Q, part of the long arm of chromosome 11. And we've known about these things for 20 years or so, and we've now built up large databases that tell us, yes, these things have prognostic implications, particularly in the era of chemotherapy, with some of the newer therapies that are coming, Perhaps it's not as important as it used to be. But undoubtedly with chemotherapy, these are quite predictive. They're predictive in terms of time to first therapy. They're predictive in terms of how people respond to therapy, depth of remission. And they're predictive in terms of how long patients keep the remission. So those are three different areas that they're actually predictive for. And just as because patients do sometimes ask, is that all of my DNA? No, it's not. Of course, this is a test done on the leukemia cells. If you took a cheek swab or looked at skin cells, they wouldn't have these abnormalities. They are leukemia specific. Oh, normal just means with the standard probes, we haven't been able to find anything. You're right. That is, um, you're right. <laughs> it shouldn't be in the abnormal. I should have a separate section that says normal and abnormal. So, I mean, you see, I've given these talks so many times and no one's ever pointed that out to me. <laughs> so, TP53, so that is a, a big area of interest to clinicians, patients and researchers alike. So, TP53 is the gene that makes this special protein and that is a key regulator of all cellular processes. And we know that TP53 allows genetic mistakes and bad cells to be killed off. So there's a process called apoptosis whereby the body correctly and rightly kills off cells. It's a key part of human beings, how we grow, how you grow in the uterus, how you develop and things that you have turnover of cells. You've got, it's like putting your rubbish out every week for the dustbin. You've got to have a process whereby you kill things off. And highly dividing cells, mistakes are made. You get breaks in the DNA, you get ends that shouldn't be there or misreplication. And the body recognises this and says, well, 
that's a mistake, got to kill it, got to kill it. And TP53 is part of this process because it directs cell death in response to DNA damage. So if you stick with me on this one, it is a bit complicated, but I think you are videoing this and you put it on the website. Yes, yeah, so people can actually sort of look over it again. So if you stick with me, chemotherapy works by damaging DNA. And those proliferative leukemic cells are more prone to damage with the chemotherapy because they're dividing and turning over. Therefore, they get damaged. And as they get damaged, they've got to die. But part of dying is having this intact mechanism whereby the cell's damage, it recognises it's got to die, so off it goes. So you can see, if you are missing TP53, you're missing a key part of your cellular process that actually says, you've been damaged, you must die. So those damaged cells are not dying as they should do. And that's one of the reasons why patients with these abnormalities simply don't respond as well to chemotherapy. It may be a reason why these bad cells should not be treated with chemotherapy because you might induce problems because the chemo can damage the DNA. But instead of the cell dying, actually it gets a bit stronger. As you can see how that has evolved, and it's one of the challenges of managing patients with TP53 uh, dysfunctional DNA. Now, the classic way of looking for that has always been the 17p deletion. It's very straightforward. You do the fish test, you get an answer within 24, 48 hours on the peripheral blood. Uh, but what we are doing now is much more uh, TP53 sequencing. And the reason we're doing that is we know that some patients might not be deleted, so they might have intact chromosomes, but they can have a mutation in that gene. So that stretch of DNA can have a problem within it that you will only detect if you actually sequence the TP53 gene. And it's definitely part of the next guidelines that we are advising that the TP53 gene should be sequenced because without getting too complicated it's a dominant negative mutation so it interferes if you've taking back to your molecular genetics and I mustn't get too complicated so forgive me but you have two copies in a normal functioning cell two alleles and if you have a mutated one and a normal one they make their protein they're off floating around but this mutated one interferes with the function of the normal one so even if you've got a normal wild-type allele, if you've got a mutated allele, it might not work properly. So you end up with this effect. So we're now pushing to sequence all patients with uh, for TP53. Question? No. No. So that's something we're moving to. So every, the regional laboratories have their own strategy <laughs> for doing this. So now in Cambridge, we've got this hotspot sequencing that, um, as you know, Crick and Watson and DNA and all that type of thing happens in Cambridge. So my colleagues in the lab are really quite into this and have set up these hotspot multi-gene sequencing platforms. So we sequence lots of genes. They give me all sorts of information that I'm struggling to work out what to do with at the moment. But the main thing we're looking at is TP53. Yeah, so this. Yeah, so it's, so we know that if I just pluck a figure, four or five percent of patients at diagnosis can have a TP53 mutation, but have a, ooh, ooh, but intact by fish. But we also know now through there, if you're really getting into the minutia, if you have a 13Q deleted patient who's behaving abnorm abnormally, there are all sorts of other genes that can cause difficult CLL through mutations in the small percentage, we're talking 1-2%, uh, whether you're going to find those in routine practice is a different question. Of course, that opens a whole debate as to when are we going to do this whole exome and whole genome sequencing on all patients. Uh, and it's amazing how fast things are changing in the laboratory. That's down to about mm, £3,000 now for doing a whole genome. So you can see it coming into routine practice. Whether that will help us manage that type of challenge in patient is another question. Because remember, finding out information, finding out its significance, and then implementing it in a way that changes practice is actually, they're quite different things. Yeah, 
Yes, so TP53 is more straightforward because, as we'll come on to, we've now got drugs that we can use if you're TP53 mutated. And it's one of the reasons why we're pushing this thing, that um, if you don't do the sequencing, you won't know. And that's one thing that actually now that uh, even NICE is allowing us to use different drugs in patients who have abnormalities of the TP53 uh, network, why we should be sequencing it. Okay. Immunoglobulin mutations. Now, for those of you who are not into science, just honestly close your ears for the next minute because this is all a bit complicated. But again, another Cambridge story behind the uh, mapping out of this amazing bit of nature. So when I said to you that we all have this potential capacity to respond to unknown pathogens, a lot of this comes down to this amazing thing that goes on with our immunoglobulins. So immunoglobulins, these are the antibody proteins that are made by our B cells. Remember, CLL is a B cell, but we have lots of other B cells that are there normally making this big repertoire of different antibodies. They float around the blood, they get secreted into tissues, and they're a key part of our immune response. But they are highly complicated in their structure. And just to remind you, basic biology, you start with DNA. DNA is transcribed to RNA. That's a mediator complex, a structure that goes from the nucleus, where the DNA is doing its stuff. And then the RNA is made into the proteins, and the immunoglobulins are proteins. And this is the absolute fact of life. You go DNA, <coughs> RNA, proteins. DNA, RNA, proteins. So to change that protein, to give it more specificity so it recognises different things, what the human body has evolved, well, mammals, and they've evolved this system of changing the DNA in the immunoglobulin locus. So when your B cell is brand new, it comes out of the marrow, it's capable of everything. It's like a Cambridge undergraduate, they're capable of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to, I went, oh no, I'll stop that. <laughs> so it comes out of the marrow and they're capable of everything. But those cells, as they go into the lymph nodes, they transition, they move through bits of the lymph node and they get exposed to bugs and things that drive this process of specialization. And the immunoglobulin genes mutate. So this is when it comes out of fresh from the bone marrow and then it takes a bit of that a bit of that, a bit of that. It gets exposed and then they switch away. But all you need to know is they start off unmutated. They get exposed to bugs, antigens, and then they become mutated. They become specialized with this very clever antibody structure. So therefore, your immunoglobulins have this random chance of seeing anything. Because depending on what that protein structure is, depends on what it can see. So your antibodies, they might look like this, and so you don't know what that pathogen's gonna look like. Because remember, in structural biology, that's a bit of a silly thing to say to a big group of people, but everything is all about protein-protein interactions, and you don't know whether you're gonna grab that pathogen, that bug, you're gonna grab it that way or that way. And that's why the body makes all of these different combinations. And if it happens to be that one, well, those cells get amplified and make loads of that one so it can fight off the bug. And that's this classic thing going from unmutated to mutated, and it allows us to fight off all these pathogens. Now, in CLL, that is really important because if your CLL has arisen from the unmutated, so the earlier ones, those CLLs are more aggressive. They respond less well to chemo. They come back, and unfortunately, people, there's a higher mortality. This is all before the newer therapies, which are trumping a lot of this. The Hypermutated and mutated CLLs tend to be more benign, tend to go a lot longer before they need treatment. They tend to respond to chemotherapy better. And with chemotherapy, can have these incredibly long remissions. So we now biologically split CLL into the unmutated CLL and the mutated CLL. And they tend to behave quite differently. Now, again, it's back to this population thing. If you've got 100 people, you can say, well, yes, statistically, much more likely to do this or to do that. For the individual in front of you in the clinic, it's harder. But it can certainly be very useful. How, how easy is it to make that distinction between mutated and unmutated? Is, is that something part of the fish test or is that a separate? 
note. So this is very much a different test. It's again molecular sequencing and it needs a specialized lab. Most people, it's quite easy to separate their CLL. If you're unmutated and you sequence your CLL cells and show that the sequence is exactly the same as, their, as germline, Ooh, didn't mean to do that, uh, then, hmm, sorry, I'll click something there. Uh, so if you sequence it and it's exactly the same, then it's unmutated, very easy. What can sometimes happen, you can have subclones, you can have a bit of mutation, and so, I don't know, 5 10% of patients might be harder to separate, but it's not fish, it's a different test. Is it, is it, a, is it an expensive test, or is it one that a normal clinic yeah, so there's a lot of debate about that. And again, there are some centres in the UK, so in Cambridge, I will always, I now sequence my patients before I treat them. There are other centres that don't prioritise that. <coughs> ah, that's a very good question. So we'll talk a little bit about immunoglobulin replacement. Of course, immunoglobulin immunoglobulin replacement is replacing a lack of immunoglobulins with lots of healthy stuff from healthy donors. So that's a, a bit of a different thing. And we know that CLL patients, as the years pass, can often lose their immunoglobulin levels. They just go down and down as they get more prone to infection. And then having donor immunoglobulin can actually really boost them up. A bit separate from this thing. Okay. So this is a very good question. So let me be really clear. The mutated unmutated is a hallmark of someone's CLL. That's what they have for life. It doesn't change. If you had an unmutated who got mutated, then they've got CLL again. <coughs> Sounds crazy, but you can actually get CLL again. It's like if you have Hodgkin's and get lymphoma. You, are, you can get a, the same disease again. Really small print, so we won't worry about that. But it's basically the same for life. So I tend to say, if we're going to do it, we'll do it early on. What you're talking about, fish testing, we've tended to say, look, if you're not doing things that aren't going to influence management, then why do it at the beginning? And there is still logic in that. And, and, and genuinely, if you have somebody who's 78, very well, they've got early stage CLR with a limb site count of nine, is it? Is it correct, if you're planning NHS resource spending, is it right to do 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds worth of laboratory workup on that patient? When there's a very good chance CLL will never impact on their life. So I think you've got to accept there's a degree of sense. But if a patient nowadays says to me, I want to know everything about my CLL, I do it. Uh, so people with chronic bacterial infections tend to have a poly-expansion of immunoglobulins and they will all be mutated because that's part of the natural immune response. And chronic viral infections, so HIV can do the same actually. So the simplification slide, so if all of the molecular biology discussion just put you to sleep, then we've got a good and a bad side. So good. Early stage, 13Q deletion, no 17P, uh, no TP53 and mutated immunoglobulins. And bad is basically the opposite with the addition of the 11Q. But good and bad, we've got to remember as times change and new therapies coming, come along, it's amazing how what you think of as bad can suddenly become slightly uncertain. <coughs> Because new treatments work differently. And so actually what we think of as bad from before might not be bad in 2020. So you've got to remember that. It's a slightly change, potentially changing uh, ballpark. So when to treat? How are we doing for time? It is quarter to 12. Oh, my goodness. But I suppose we're taking questions as we're going along, aren't we? So, yeah. uh, when to treat? With conventional therapy, we have to make the statement, CLL cannot be cured. So patients have CLL. Allogeneic transplant, this small niche area that I'm not going to talk about, uh, gives the potential to cure CLL. But we tend to think that CLL cannot be cured. 
No trial has ever shown survival benefit with early use of chemo in early stage CLR. There are a number of trials in the past. Now, of course, rightly you can turn around and say, in this era of new drugs and new agents, can we still be as confident with that statement? And we can't be. But still, the basic philosophy is that if you are well with early stage CLL, then there is no indication to treat. And this international standard of care remains watch and wait for early stage CLL. Now, I, every CLL doctor knows the, the, the difficulties with watch and wait. And we, we, get, we get all reactions. The dreaded watch and wait, as I've put here, some people say fantastic they come and talk to me they've got leukemia I said no actually we don't need to treat you there's no evidence that you do better uh, and it's ah oh, amazing fantastic yeah, I don't want to think about this uh, can I go back to my GP brilliant that's we know all characters are different um, how can you leave my cancer just to get worse or this is the NHS or doctor follows if I see you privately I bet there's something Booper would give me and you're saying <laughs> no that CLL treatment there is no evidence even if you were the shape of wherever, uh, it would be bad practice to treat somebody who has early stage at CLL. Um, we're coming on to vitamin D. I said I'd bring you in on the vitamin D. We're coming there. We're coming there. And I've put here the passage of time, because that reminds me to say to those first few months are really difficult and if you or a relative is going through that at the moment you've just got to ride it out because that transition from being well to suddenly have leukemia is really tough for people to cope with and i say to them look you've just got to hang in there and even the most anxious and people whose life really is turned on its head eventually get there they come to terms i think partly as the months go by and they most people in this state don't become too unwell and they slowly come to terms with that this is there, that they move into this. And the reason I put the passage of time is to remind me that again, time and time again, you get patients who are most keen on having some treatment up front. It can't be right. But as the years pass, three, four, five years later, I say, okay, I think we probably should be thinking about chemotherapy. They can switch completely the other direction and by then are totally anti the idea of chemotherapy. And how could you possibly be treating me? Um, I've looked and statistically I have 8.37 years before I get treatment and I'm not having it at 6.24. So everybody is different and, and it's just a question of working through with people where they are. Now this is moving on to the supportive care bit. Um, so keeping fit, I try to say to my patients, look, if you can keep fit, keeping off cigarettes and alcohol too much, I mean, obviously life is life, uh, keeping exercising, keeping yourself in a position that when treatment is needed, you're going to have a better performance status. Because this whole thing, cancer doctors talk about performance status. Are you fit and well? Across the board in cancer medicine, correlates with how well people do with treatment. So I say to people, keep fit, keep yourself uh, exercising, stay healthy. Look out for infections. Act early. There are two big data sets, a UK and a US one, showing that early stage patients are more likely to be hospitalised with a chest infection before they've been treated than age match controls. More likely in a year to have tablet antibiotics from their GP. All of these things are recurrent there with CLL and early stage. If they're recurrent, then you've got to flag these up because this comes to the immunoglobulin replacement that we know certain CLL patients, quality of life can be improved dramatically by having immunoglobulin replacement if they are IgG deficient particularly. That's this particular type of immunoglobulin that we can replace from donors. And some people's lives are turned around. Some people dread winter and the infections are coming and they end up locking themselves in the house. They're so convinced they're going to catch something going anywhere. And immunoglobulin, for some patients, can really turn that around. I actually tend to refer my uh, hypogamma patients onto the immunology service because they do loads of clever stuff with vaccinations. There are rotating antibiotic strategies, maybe just prophylactic antibiotics through the winter and then off in the summer and all sorts of strategies they can do, uh, which I, I tend to hand over to them. No, 
No, there isn't actually. So the <laughs> I've definitely heard the dental message. Uh, we, yeah, there, there isn't. There isn't. Uh, so vaccination. So I tend to recommend my early stage patients to be vaccinated against what, what we call encapsulated bacteria. So that's pneumococcus, meningococcus, haemophilus. These are the common bugs that are out there, and these vaccines are available in primary care. We, of course, it's hard to actually prove the evidence on our National Guidelines Committee. We talked about this at length, but we think it is simply good practice. If you've got early stage CLL, to boost up your immunity, because as we know, CLL progresses over the years. There's a gradual loss of immunity, and actually boosting yourself up early seems sensible. Influenza vaccine, get your flu jab every year. Uh, we've put, I put no live vaccines, because that is a rule within CLL that actually, so things like the shingles vaccine, uh, the live vaccine got to be very careful of. Another question? <laughs> so, of course, I'd say every fifth patient says to me, you know that flu jab? But I've even come across my colleagues in Adam Brooks who tell me, they're simply not having, they try every year to get one of those badges, you, they come and give us a flu buster sticker, because the NHS is so keen on all of our staff being vaccinated, uh, but they said they're not going to get their flu buster sticker this year, because it makes them feel rotten. And some people clearly react badly to uh, influenza vaccines, and again, I tell all my patients to have it, if they say to me, look doc, you made me feel awful and I was in bed for three days, I say, well, okay. I, I can't explain that, but you do, you cannot get flu from the jab. <laughs> we're coming on to vitamin D, but we're not talking about teeth anymore. <laughs> Don't worry, it's coming, we're, we're there, we're there. The sunshine vitamin. Yes. Yeah. No, so that is a, it's a good question. We know that unfortunately CLL, particularly as it progresses, don't make very good vaccine responses. It's one of the things that also goes hand in hand with immunoglobulin replacement. And there was this discussion whether people should have two vaccine doses rather than one. Unfortunately, I can't give you a firm advice on that. I haven't seen it written down that that's formal advice. I know that within the immunology clinic, they sometimes do a double vaccination of pneumococcus and the meningococcus, but unfortunately, I don't have enough understanding to say, yes, if you double vaccinate, your chance of immune competence goes from 50% to 70%. It wouldn't be harmful. So if you've got a good relationship with your GP and you think, actually, I don't react badly to flu, I'll have a double vaccine a week apart, then maybe that's reasonable, but I, I can't advise on that. Uh, yes, uh, again, I don't have enough expertise to advise. Yep. Vitamin D and green tea. So these are the things that come up in conversations repeatedly. So we know that vitamin D deficiency associates with a range of things. So increased cancer risk, breast, colorectal, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there have been some attempts to try and show that if you replace vitamin D, you can reduce risk of cancer. Uh, and it is quite controversial, but there is data that's out there. It's difficult. So we can say that people with low, vit rates of, low levels of vitamin D have a higher rates of cancer. And it appears that if you are diagnosed with cancer and have low levels of vitamin D, you have more metastatic disease. You do less well with it. Huge population studies have tried to uh, pin this down a bit more, and CLL has been one of them. Where uh, there are two data sets, uh, Tate Scharnefelt from uh, the States was the one that really led the way when they took their fairly decent number of newly diagnosed CLL, measured their vitamin D levels at diagnosis, and then plotted and saw what happened to them. And they found that those who were vitamin D deficient had more chance of getting treatment earlier. Now, you've got to remember that that could be a surrogate for all sorts of other things. It may be people who don't eat as well, people who are less fit, people who have a lower socioeconomic status. There are all of these things that can 
co-segregate. And it's, it really is challenging territory to actually uh, say, well, there's one variable and that isn't there. Well, that translates to that. Now, I know a lot of my patients are absolute advocates uh, for taking vitamin D. And my best advocate is here in the <laughs> audience uh, who takes very high doses. Now, my worry about very high doses is vitamin D, like all things in life, vitamin D can associate with toxicity, <laughs> abnormalities of calcium metabolism. Uh, it can affect renal function. Oh, no, you're going to let me finish this time. So <laughs> high dose vitamin D, I cannot recommend. And I say to my patients, I fully understand if you want to take vitamin D supplements. Perhaps we should all be taking vitamin D supplements, but I do not have prospective data. I don't have data in CLL where I can say we took 500 newly diagnosed and those we gave 25 micrograms of vitamin D to and those we didn't do anything. And there's so much variability because people will be self-dosing. And it's, this underpins all the problems with, say, the aspirin trials in cancer because people take that and people are variable. And it's very hard to say, but... I'm absolutely sure from what I've seen is relatively low dose vitamin D is probably absolutely fine. better when they took vitamin D. So, yep, I've had that question. What do you call high level of vitamin D? So, I, I thought, should I give you numbers and advice? And I'm not going to, because it is not a registered, recommended drug. If you go into Boots and you look at the supplements, they go from uh, low level to high. You will see. I, I think people talk about things like 25 microgram dosing and things, which is not particularly high. So I, I, because we're going to keep moving, I've, there's a lot to talk about new therapies. I think what we should do is those who have a specialist interest in vitamin D should speak to you afterwards. Is that a good compromise? That then, because then, there will be some people who are really interested, and I'm sure you know a lot more about vitamin D biochemistry than I do. So, uh, I know. And so I think that's why people want, no, 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 I'm not disbelieving it, but I think people should speak to you individually afterwards so we can keep moving, because we haven't even mentioned ibrutinib, the word. <laughs> Green tea, so that's another uh, favourite because it's easy to drink a bit of green tea uh, and dietary flavonoid intake, intake does appear to be associated with a reduced risk of certain cancers. Uh, people have tried to look at that. You can take this polyphenon E, this flavonoid out of CLL, concentrate it and the equivalent of that number of cups of green tea, you'd spend your life in the bathroom if you drank all of that lot. <laughs> Um, and they've actually been able to show that it's relatively well tolerated with reductions of blood counts, uh, lymph nodes decrease in size. You've got to be a little bit careful. It can inflame the liver. And again, one of the problems of just deciding you're going to go to the health shop and get super high doses of concentrated green tea and drink it. We don't know whether that means anything. I truly don't know. If you reduce your lymphocyte count by taking polyphenol E, does that mean in 10 years' time you're likely to be in a better state? I just do not know. I say to people, if you like green tea, drink green tea. Uh, I wouldn't be drinking all of those cups of green tea every day. So moving on, on to treatment, because I'm aware we've talked for an hour, we haven't got to treatment yet, so we will move a bit faster. When is treatment needed? Well, it's when patients are coming to you and their quality of life is impaired, or if their blood parameters are changing to a degree that is worrying you. But with CLL, there is no better disease than CLL for an example of where you develop a relationship with a patient and you get a feel for it. And I always say starting treatment in CLL is a negotiated position. Patients have their own view and you have your view. It's actually pretty uncommon in modern medicine now for patients to just go, what have you say, doc? 
whatever you say. That. Well, it is in Cambridge. Our patients seem very well motivated and engaged. Uh, so it's a, you just discuss this with them and you work out with them when is it going to be. But the world of CLL therapeutics is changing. So I, my first uh, haematology job was in 1995. And there we had fludarabin. Clarangosil's been around since the Chesty Beatty lab discovered that. Uh, and then if you were really brave, you'd give fludarabin with cyclophosphamide that was coming in. Uh, and then now, this explosion of therapeutics. This is wonderful, and this is challenging, because it's wonderful to have all of these new drugs. It's challenging to know how to use them in the best possible way for your patient. And I like to say when I'm with the patient, if this is a strategic thing. You're not thinking of just that one move. You're thinking of all of your moves and trying to work out how that patient fits together with these different moves. If you're 55 with CLL, you're sat there trying to plan the next 25, 30 years, hopefully. You're not planning the next three years or two years. And so you've always got to bear that in mind when you're making decisions in patients with CLL. So what treatment options are there? Well, we've got first-line treatments and uh, relapsed treatments. We've got treatments that are better for fit patients, treatments better for the less fit. We've got treatments now, and we've got treatments in the future. And as I say to my patients, it's very hard to sit here in 2017 with the explosion of developments that are ongoing to say in... 2023, 2025, what the treatment will be for either first-line or lapsed CLL. So where are we in the UK? If you are fit and you're not 17 p deleted or mutated at TP53, well, off trial, uh, FCR remains our standard. There's controversy about BR, which we'll touch on. Uh, and our current UK trial is FCR versus ibrutinib R. I'm going to save discussion of ibrutinib to a bit later in the talk. And we're now opening a third arm with venetoclax, which I'm going to talk to again later. So FCR and BR. So FCR chemotherapy is a highly effective chemotherapy regimen in treating CLL. It has high response rates, generally well tolerated, and translates into long first remissions. The Germans ran this study comparing FCR with BR in frontline, and they showed that if you track these patients three, four years down the line, that you've got an advantage. You're more likely to stay in remission with FCR than BR. For those of you who are not familiar with Kaplan-Meier plots, I should have just said that when you look at a, a median progression-free survival, that's when, if you had 100 people, when 50 of them have fallen out of remission for whatever reason. Death, relapse, uh, actually that's how you define a PFS. And, and so a 50 is where this part of the axis is halfway across so where that intersects 50. So the median length of staying in remission with FCR, for sake of the argument, is pushing five years. Um, Bendamustin is about a year or a bit more less than that. But when you look at overall survival, they're completely overlapping. And that's because, of course, there are so many other therapies down the line that it gets quite hard to start separating overall survivals with your first line curve. So we have this, what we call a surrogate. Progression-free survival is a surrogate, a bit like MRD, which I'm not really touching on, the, the mineral residual disease. I'll only touch on that if people ask me specific questions. But these are surrogates of how well people are going to do. So why is there any debate? FCR surely is the best. It keeps people in remission for an extra year. Well, FCR does have a higher risk of making people unwell. So this high, this is infections, with 40% of patients having infections bad enough to put them in hospital, compared with bendamustin rituximab, 25%. These secondary acute leukemias, and that is a big worry for patients. The numbers are small, thankfully they're small, but six cases out of 280 compared with one with bendamustin rituximab. And it is internationally accepted that FCR has a higher chance of damaging your bone marrow and therefore triggering one of these extremely difficult second acute leukemias that come. And also second cancers are probably higher patients treated with FCR. And the other thing with FCR, it's the infections after treatment that you've really got to uh, look out for, 12% versus 3%. And that's probably translated into some treatment-related mortality in that big study. 
big German study run in lots of oncology centers. People have finished their treatment, off they go, and people haven't really kept an eye on them very carefully, potentially. We've seen similar data with FCR in mantle cell lymphoma of infection-related deaths. And I think it's because in that first six months post-FCR, you really do need to remember you keep an eye on people and make sure those patients are aware that if they get unwell at all, they've got to get in touch with your unit. But FCR can have these remarkably long remissions. And patients with mutated immunoglobulin chains at the IgG, remember I was talking about, can have these really long remissions. And if you've got 60% of people still in a remission at 10 years, well, maybe a chunk of those are cured of their CLR. I think it's really important to remember that. So if you have mutated immunoglobulins, and particularly these mutated 13 Qs, you can get incredibly long remissions with FCR. So actually, the higher rate of infections and also this dreaded myelodysplasia, if it's 5% versus 1%, that patient might turn around to you and say, you know what, doc, I'm, I accept there is those higher other risks, but I'm going for this long play, and I want to actually give myself this chance. But actually, this is the original MD Anderson data with incredibly long follow-up. 10% of the unmutateds are still in remission down there. So back to what I said about populations, it's hard with an individual to say you will or won't be in a remission at 10 years from now. It's all about trying to balance those statistics when you're making your decisions. I've actually, in this room, there is one of my patients who has just uh, finished his sixth infusions of FCR and has had a complete transformation of his life and if anybody here is worried about FCR afterwards, I know this patient said he was happy for me to introduce him to them, uh, who has been transformed, cruised through FCR brilliantly uh, and so that would be, uh, I could introduce you afterwards if you wanted to. So first line less fit, Chlorambucil, which is this mainstay drug because it's easy, it's tablet, it's got a very good side effect profile uh, and we've used it for years, so we're very familiar, has been paired up with these different antibodies, abinutuzumab, bofitumumab, rituximab, that, they, that is the R in FCR, sorry, on BR, I should have stressed that, the rituximab. And I've also put bendamustin and rituximab because we know that there's quite a lot of use of BR in less fit or particularly uh, older patients. In, in Germany, that is their standard uh, first-line chemotherapy for patients over 65 who don't have the 17P. And I put ibrutinib there because that is uh, now licensed. It's not available in the NHS. Uh, I don't think it will become available as first-line for less fit because of the cost implications. And that's a bit of a separate debate, which I'm happy to get into with people. Um, it, it, which is causing a little bit of stress because some people really want to get access to ibrutinib up front, but it is not, if you don't have 17p deletion, it is not commissioned <coughs> treatment. Um, so CLL11, so this was the big German trial that we and other centres in the UK also joined in to compare this new Roche antibody, uh, the GA101, which is why it's got a G. The drugs, remember, they all change their names, so GA101, abinutuzumab, gazivro, it's all the same thing, uh, it's this antibody, and showed that with a different schedule from rituximab, so there's a bit of controversy there, but the drug does appear to work quite well with CLL in pushing people into longer remissions and pushing patients. On average, it's four years from starting therapy to time to next treatment. So that combination, well tolerated, outpatient therapy, does well and can keep people uh, off treatment for four years or so. And it has a range of adverse events, which I'll keep moving on. So, now, I've put in one slide by Bruton in first line. Okay, I think I debated whether I was going to do that. Um, so ibrutinib first line, we're going to talk about ibrutinib as one of these new therapies that has really changed CLL, particularly in the relapsed refractory setting. And it's worth pointing out that ibrutinib has made such a massive impact because People who've had a lot of treatment, two, three, four previous lines of therapy, can be in a very challenging place. And ibrutinib, undoubtedly, is a remarkable drug. Well tolerated, turns people around, it's a tablet, and has categorically increased survival. And I'll be showing some of our UK data. First line, it's quite different. And it's hard to know, it genuinely is hard to know whether it's the right thing to start tablet treatment 
that is designed that you always take that tablet treatment. Is that better than having six months of chemotherapy and then coming off therapy? And it's been quite interesting seeing how things change. So when ibrutinib was brand new, I would get patients travelling from miles around to come and see me in Cambridge to discuss this, or very keen to get on the trial. They were desperate to get ibrutinib first line. And that, I feel that view's changed a little bit. People aren't, just aren't sure. And one of the problems is we genuinely don't know what the long-term effects of taking these drugs are. I can't say to you what happens when you've been on ibrutinib for seven years because there aren't human beings who've been on it that long. And so we, we just don't know, and it is a bit of a watch this space. In the relapsed refractory setting, it's easy to know because without it, the patients wouldn't be alive. So I don't think we're going to worry about what's going to happen in five years. But in the first-line setting, it's genuinely uncertain. One of the reasons we're doing the FLARE trial and other trials have been done. So this is the upfront trial that led to ibrutinib getting its license in, the, in Europe. So it is licensed as a drug that's out there. I guess if you wanted to pay or use insurance, you could get it. But that doesn't mean you should get it, if you see what I mean. Those are quite, quite different things. But compared with chlorambucil, and this is low-dose uh, chlorambucil therapy on its own without an antibody, yes, more patients stay in remission. But we're really not sure what that actually means at this stage. So first-line treatment for patients with 17p deletion. So we used to use this drug, alamtuzumab. Uh, alamtuzumab's other name is CAMPATH, stands for Cambridge Pathology. It was developed only a, a couple of miles away from here. Remarkably potent drug for CLL, but unfortunately a remarkably potent drug for wiping out your immune system. So it's one of the problems with CAMPATH is that we have all got patients who have, in our clinics, who've done amazingly well, and, uh, uh, and I see that around the room looking today, who have been in remissions for 10 years, and it is an incredible drug, but it comes with a bit of hangover because it really bashes your immune system down and the problems you get from that. Now, our old UK data... First line patients with 17p deleted, about a, uh, half of them were still in remission at 18 months when treated with alentuzumab and steroid. So hardly a wonder drug, but it was, and particularly because it was tough and associated with infections. So you can see why we were all looking for alternatives. And the ibrutinib data for first line CLR, this is how many are still taking their drug. If you track that across to two years, you've got, I don't know, pushing 60, 70% of people are still on drug at two years. So ibrutinib, which is a tablet, the vast majority of people tolerate it well, uh, is undoubtedly our best choice for treating upfront. Well, ibrutinib, or in all fairness, rituximab combined with idololysib, which is another alternative I'll come on and talk about. Yeah, so to keep the talk moving, so what you're referring to there is this deep sequencing program that Ohio State are running uh, in the States where they're looking for the evolution of mutations that affect the ibrutinib binding site. And that's absolutely correct. So as we... Yeah, I'll, I'll speak. <laughs> so we know that if you are constantly exposing a cancer to a drug, there is a risk of Darwinian evolution. That's a fact. Cancers are clever and they evolve around it. So it's back to my point that if you are using a drug in the relapsed refractory setting, and let me show you, did I include that slide? So in this setting, before ibrutinib came along, you can show this curve and say, well, look, half of patients have died by 12 months. So this is what happened for the Darabin refractory CLL. These patients in the clinic, and so the first five years of running the CLL clinic in Cambridge, this is what happened. So you're right, Ohio State are deep sequencing the subclones and showing the evolution of patients with the C481 mutation in the ibrutinib binding site. That's right. It doesn't mean all those patients are ill, and it doesn't mean they've had their disease relapse. It is part of this evolving model, and it's why I can't say to you what will happen in six years or ten years on ibrutinib. But if you are going to get six or ten years, that's very different from half of patients being dead by 12 months. So I think in the relapsed refractory setting, this is absolutely a no-brainer. 
in the first line setting, it always raises these questions. So with relapsed CLL, the big debate at the moment is who should you retreat with antibody and chemotherapy and who should you be treating with, with one of these new therapies? And that's quite controversial and it's also heavily influenced by what NICE will fund because these drugs are getting their licences and for those of you who are really into this will know that Pete Hillman and I uh, had a, a, an intense morning, we'll put it like that, with NICE uh, around the ibrutinib approval. That has now been approved. It seems to be a slightly moving space with some stress from NHS England we came across, David and I came across uh, two days ago, so that's a watch this space. Uh, rituximab idolalacib is approved by NICE in the relapse setting certain restrictions onto how it can be used. And then venetoclax, this other remarkable new drug that I'll be showing you some things on, that has been licensed by the European Medicine Agency for use in patients who fail ibrutinib or idella. And that was why I was in Manchester in January before the NICE panel trying to make the case for uh, the expert opinion on venetoclax and trying to get that through the NICE process which is currently underway. So why do we think the world has changed? Well, these pictures are all floating around around the talks of patients treated with idolalacid. And I'm still not sure this is the same patient, but these are from Susan O'Brien, who absolutely insists they are, uh, with big lymph nodes. And the classic thing with treating patients with these new drugs, they're remarkably effective at shrinking lymph nodes. And also people tend to feel much better in themselves when they've started. So night sweats can improve. The quirk with them is that they push up the lymphocyte count while reducing your lymph nodes. They're a strange way of working. But they are very specific. They target these molecules that sit underneath the membrane that are driving signals in the B cells. So without getting too stuck in molecular biology again, the B cells all have these immunoglobulins who sit on the surface. And what we know in CLL now is that it's quite a dynamic thing. These are not cancer cells that you could just put them in a petri dish in the lab and they would just sit there happily for a few weeks growing away. These things are really dependent on microenvironment signaling. They go in and out of the lymph nodes and get their signals and the bone marrow and they signal down through the immunoglobulin receptor and they're just saying live, divide, keep active. They, when they're tiring they go back into the lymph node, they get another booster, they have their shreddies with sugar on and out they go, sort of ready to fight again. And that's part of this proliferative cycle of CLL. And then you start people on these drugs that are designed to target these signaling pathways and they block here and they take away this drive. So the lymph nodes shrink down, they leak into the blood and the lymphocyte count goes up. Sometimes can get up to three, four hundred. And the very first patients on these trials were the first couple apparently were taken off before the third one said, look, I feel brilliant and my lymph nodes are gone. I don't care what my lymphocyte count's done. But it is something you have to flag up to patients. Say, look, just be aware, your lymphocyte count is 60. When we start this drug, a month from now it could be 120. Don't worry about it. And then they gradually over time come down. So you create this state where you're putting these inert cells into the blood because you're targeting these things. And there are loads of companies now who have different drugs coming through the pathway uh, of uh, uh, downstream there. Lots of variations on the theme. This is the, third, this is the phase one trial when it's first presented with ibrutinib that really jumped out at us. So these are heavily pre-treated patients. And this is the zero line. And everything down is a lymph node getting smaller. And everything up is a lymph node getting bigger. We call these waterfall plots because they're very good snapshots of early phase trials when you're wanting to get rapid visual assessment. Is a drug working? And normally waterfall plots, most people with cancer are getting worse, then a few has them, and then a few down here. And so when these waterfall plots were shown at the American conference a few years ago now, people were just absolutely agog. How could these incredibly challenging patients with such short life expectancy be turned around so remarkably? But undoubtedly, they did. Yes. Um, 
So you, you could have been my stooge questioner to ask me one of my favourite topics, the dosing of ibrutinib. So um, I will be showing you some of our UK CLL forum data where I've been collecting data from 62 centres across uh, the UK and Ireland. Fascinating data on dosing, really fascinating, and I'll show you some slides because I completely accept that. I also accept all of these strategies that we could look at with how it's dosed and you could take people on for three years, drop them down, you could have trials of treatment breaks and restarting. All these things could be done. They won't be done for all sorts of complex reasons, but we'll come on to that. Yeah, the, the, re the reason behind that is obviously um, the possibility that if you, if you uh, can use a lower dosage, the adverse long-term effects may yeah. be reduced. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, this all led to the accelerated approval, and it seems amazing from first in man to accelerated approval in basically four years. All of these stories, remember, drug development takes 20 years from the lab to get approval. They've all been shrunk down massively, and the FDA has this accelerated approval program for drugs that are, uh, are likely to work for molecular reasons, and they can show efficacy. Uh, and then the trials... Oop, the trials showed this remarkable difference compared with map, and also a true survival difference. Now, true survival difference, as I said to you before, are hard to prove, but in the relapsed refractory setting, if you have something that works, it truly works. And here, the curves were diverging. They then amended the trial, which permitted patients on map to cross over, and then the curves came together again on survival. So undoubtedly, ibrutinib improves survival in the relapsed refractory setting. So... Part of our UK uh, bid to try and collect all our data together when ibrutinib became available from the name uh, patient scheme was when I was, as I said, I chaired the CLL forum to last year and I was very keen to try and get the CLL forum involved in real world data collection and get buy-in from the community. Uh, and in the UK had remarkable uptake of ibrutinib. And so to give you a feeling in... Janssen, when, the, when this drug was coming through its approvals, they're aware that it's difficult for clinicians to get approval until it gets into their various schemes, etc. And they made the drug available internationally, and there were 1,500, 1,600 patients in the world who got access to ibrutinib for free. A third of those were in the UK, which is really remarkable. It just... I think shows the engagement of UK clinicians and brackets, it was free, so the hospitals allowed us to get it, uh, which is a slightly sad state of affairs, but uh, that is undoubtedly a fact. So our patients, I, I don't want to get too stuck in this, it's actually, the slides are online on the CLL Support Association website, and the paper is published, so you can look through all of this, but uh, heavily pre-treated patients, we had uh, a quarter of the patients were poorer performance status, uh, and 15% of our patients were over 80 years old. So this is uh, the extremes of age are also being treated. And then we looked to the question, our, what we call the primary endpoints, what we decided to look at with the study, well, how many patients were still taking their ibrutinib at a year? And it's basically about three quarters of patients were still on uh, treatment. A bit lower than in the uh, clinical trial. Does that surprise us? No, because in the real world you often have more sick patients who wouldn't have been able to get on trial, etc., etc. There are all sorts of explanations there. And our overall survival. So remember what I said to you in the old days that by a year half of your patients had died with this rapid drop-off? Well, 83% of our patients are alive at one year. Really quite remarkable data. And then we've looked at our data split by all sorts of different things and we have some quite striking findings. So we Older patients probably do less well. That's probably a function of age, and the statisticians have looked at that in different ways. We, with what we call univariable analysis, it's quite complicated statistics I don't want to get stuck into, but we have not been able to show that 17 pd litre patients do any worse. And that is a bit of a controversial one, because internationally people do still think that ibrutinib is doing less well with 17p deletion, but we can't prove that with our UK patients. And I've just updated our data set the last uh, two weeks. My statistician emailed me one o'clock this morning some new cap and Maya plots, and I was thinking, well, they're meant to be going to Lugano, uh, the big conference where we lie in the sun in Switzerland. No, we don't. We listen to all these lectures, but I'm sending them into Lugano conference, and if they got videoed and put online, I might get into trouble. So I thought, I'm not going to put them in, tempting as it would be, but... Suffice it to say is that the 17p deleted patients, we still are not being able to show 
are really doing any worse. And the other thing, prior lines, there's a lot of interest. Should you get ibrutinib at your first relapse, or if you did well with chemo, well, why not have chemo again and save your ibrutinib for the next relapse? And this philosophy is entirely reasonable. We simply cannot show any separation of the curves. Just like Susan O'Brien with her US data, first relapse, second relapse, third relapse, if you are well enough to get going on your treatment, well, actually, the evi our evidence is that you do just as well if you're having it second or third line. Probably a bit more complicated than that with multivariable analysis. And without getting stuck into statistics, there is probably is some interaction with age and prior lines and 17p deleted, but nobody would be keeping 17p deleted for third and fourth line anyway. Idlalacib, so this is the other drug. Uh, so this drug, if ibrutinib hadn't existed, idlalacib undoubtedly would be seen as this remarkable saviour drug for CLL. It is a highly effective drug. Uh, it does the same thing, reduce lymph nodes, generally well tolerated, good response rates, with great curves in terms of how people are doing. It's just idlalacib has more issues in terms of toxicity. And so there are specific things idlalacid patients have got to keep an eye out for, so that's uh, lung, bowel problems, liver function tests and rashes, and they, so every time I talk about idlalacid, those four have got to be checked every time, and you have also got to be aware of infection risk, and so the patients on idella, you've got to always maintain quite a close eye and make sure they are educated. If they get diarrhea, they stop that drug immediately and ring you up, and that type of thing. So just a bit more complicated to use. So why do patients stop taking their ibrutinib and idlalacib? Well, infections, side effects, second cancers, progressive CLL, aggressive transformation. And so part of the work of the CLL forum, we are really crawling all over patients who stop to try and work out what that means and how we can take it further forward. Um, because what happens to people is probably heavily influenced by why they stop. So have they stopped because of a side effect? So they're getting arthralgias or rashes or something that they're, or atrial fibrillation. Or have they stopped because of their disease has transformed? It's influenced by the fitness of the patient when they stop. If you, if you stop early, because if your CLL is very early and aggressive, it might be that that patient is tremendously unlucky and they just have highly resistant disease compared with if they stop later at three or four years, they probably don't do as badly because Probably their disease isn't as bad, but also they might have access to other drugs, as I'll be showing you. So, and this is it's pretty tough reading, but I've got to say it, I can't hide behind it. Um, the patients who stopped in the first year have generally not done very well at all. So in our cohort of patients, those either relapsing or stopping because of adverse events or infections have a, quite a high death rate. Of the Richter's transformation, they are clearly the worst. So these are the ones who transform into this aggressive lymphoma, where of the 28 patients who stopped because of that, who actually came off because of Richter's, we've only got three that are still alive in the UK, and one of those has only stopped just recently. So I, I think it's a tiny number of patients are actually surviving. Stopping ibrutinib because because of progressive CLL is actually quite rare. I hear all the stories about resistance and it undoubtedly is more common as you've been taking the drug for longer. But in the first year, it's probably a handful, probably only about three or four percent of patients stop because their CLL is progressing. And this is pretty tough as well. Of the 10 patients in the UK data set who came off in the first year because their CLL was progressing, all 10 have now died. So that's pretty tough news. But beyond one year, we've got data on 15 patients who stopped because of progressive CLL, and 10 of them are alive. Now, is that because their CLL is less bad? It progressed later, so it's a biological thing. Or is it because they could get access, particularly, to this new drug, venetoclax? And we, as CLL doctors, think it's because of the latter, primarily. Access to this new drug, venetoclax, making a significant difference. And I've got the breakdowns of our UK patients treated, and the remarkably high percentage of patients treated with venetoclax are still on drug and alive. So what is venetoclax? I'm sorry, I did, we've taken a lot of time here. But anyway, venetoclax is a tablet... It targets a different mechanism. It targets the apoptosis, that cell-destroying mechanism that I mentioned early on. 
because it specifically blocks a molecule that stops apoptosis. So remember I said to you that to kill off cells or cells to recycle, they've got to be able to go through this dying phase. And it's a hallmark of cancer. Cancer cells don't <coughs> die properly. They won't apoptose because they've got these mechanisms in place. And one of them is this overexpression of this protein called BCL2. It's a hallmark of CLL. CLL patients have a lot of BCL2. It's an anti-apoptosis, so it is stopping the cells from dying. Then along comes venetoclax, and it's remarkable. It's the result of this program of work from Abbott. It's an amazing science journey to read through how they made these things called BH3 memetics, mimic the proteins, got them to slot into where this BCL2 molecule works, developed all these different compounds, and this one was ABT199, Abbott199, that had the best on-target effect and the least off-target effect, and quite amazing. So it is being developed in all sorts of different ways, in monotherapy, combination with rituximab and abinutuzumab. It's actually been combined with immunochemotherapy and also combined with ibrutinib. A lot of how a drug is developed depends on who owns at the highest level and who can set the relationships up as to how drugs are developed. It currently has a license in Europe, as I mentioned earlier, for patients post-ibrutinib. And that's what's going through the NICE process at the moment. Now, because of our relationship, we've got a good relationship with the company, they have made this drug initially available through this early access to medicine scheme in the NHS, but there are complex rules around that, and that scheme has had to close because the drug now has a license. So we're in that slightly grey zone where it's licensed and available, uh, but the only way you can get it on the NHS is if your clinician puts in an application to AbbVie and your trust will allow you to give it uh, until it comes through the commissioning process. But this is the data with this drug. Uh, we don't really have much time to go through the data sets, but there are some remarkable plots. So this is Kaplan-Meier plots a year out, patients after ibrutinib and idella, and you can see these big chunky numbers of patients who are still alive on drug a year from going on trial. A lot of controversy about this, and you can split and divide, and the expert review group at NICE rightly, and the chairman of the panel, have rightly raised all their various questions, because one big frustration is companies are not doing combination trials. They do this accelerated approval, because the FDA grants approval. You just whack through a 50-patient, single-arm, non-randomized trial, and then you get a data set but the likes of NICE want to be able to calculate how much is that worth. And so there's this constant problem that we then have trying to say to them how much it's worth. I'm just going to finish off by showing you a couple of slides of one of my patients. I'm looking around before I embarrass them, showing pictures of their stomach. They said to me in clinic I could do this. So, so this is a patient of mine who had been on ibrutinib for a couple of years, and this is their white count at 50 going up to 250. Uh, they were really quite unwell, this was in September, great big spleen, uh, and they started venetoclax. And this is what venetoclax does, it clears the peripheral blood incredibly quickly, and it's potentially a very dangerous drug in those first few weeks. And everything about venetoclax, at the beginning, you've got to be aware of this thing called a tumor lysis syndrome, where you kill off the cells so quickly. And there were two very high-profile deaths. Unfortunately, one of them was a patient very prominent in the States and had done what he photographed the tablets. And, yeah. So, and made that widely known. He was taking the drug and took his medication. And the poor chap had died within a couple of days of this tumor lysis storm. And that's what we're all terrified. It's so effective at killing off the leukemia that it kills it so quickly that the kidneys simply cannot cope. And even in a US academic center with dialysis and all of that, simply unable to cope. So now we give venetoclax in this incredibly careful, structured way where you start off with a low dose for a week, we bring them any risk of tumor lysis, bring them to hospital, keep them in overnight, hydrate them, check their bloods twice a day, and a week, and if they're okay, you bring them up a dose, and you spend four weeks doing this dose escalation. And with that slow ramp up, there have been no cases of significant clinical tumor lysis internationally. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, so that individual case is very sad, but of course they did not know that was going to happen in all fairness and defence. That's one of the problems of very early phase trials. No, so to clarify, the reactions to rituximab are primarily cytokine-mediated. So that's IL-6 uh, interferon gamma. So you get these signaling proteins dumped into the blood quickly. And some people, particularly CLL, are incredibly sensitive to rituximab. And in the UK, we tend to dose at 100 milligrams per day, really six hours, slow infusion, then give the rest the next day. You can get tumor lysis with any CLL therapy, absolute fact. But uh, with rituximab-based chemo, we might see it once a year. But really serious tumor lysis, as in needing dialysis, thankfully, we only get, uh, you know, once every few years. It's happened to me. It's happened to me, of course. Uh, and it is out there. But I think the message with the Netoclax is it will happen. It genuinely will happen if you get the dosing wrong. So you've just got to take it very carefully. It is then a very well tolerated therapy. My longest patient out is now two years out. The great shame, he was going to come today and he sent me a text. He was agonising about whether to come because I thought he should beat people. And he sent me a text 8 o'clock this morning and I didn't get it. So, uh, so he's not here. But uh, it, doing really well on this drug. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically side effect free, bit of neutropenia. But it's a well tolerated drug for many patients. And this particular patient who was really properly unwell. Uh, their quality of life really was struggling. We'd previously, ooh, we'd previously irradiated the spleen. Um, she was now housebound, not doing anything, struggling with haemoglobin. I was going to draw on all the platelet transfusion and red cells. Um, and now she's completely transfusion free, hasn't had a, a transfusion since early January. She's completely well out in the garden doing stuff. Her uh, spleen, that, I took this, you see that was done by our professional Adam Brooks photographers. And that was done by me on my phone. Uh, in clinic, so <laughs> you can, as I drew one, she's so, so kind, she's very, very keen to show this to people, so, uh, a question? No, no, this is monotherapy. Oh, you're right, you see, another point, thank you. So, while on ibrutinib until September the whatever, so, that's the other thing. If you've got people with rapidly progressive disease and ibrutinib, you've got to really make sure you've got your strategy in place for next therapy. Because if you stop it and say, we'll then work out what's going to happen over the next two or three weeks, that's just, that can work very badly. So you've got to have your tablet ready so you take your ibrutinib to literally the day, the night before, and you start the next day. Is there any evidence with the of, of achieving um, full remission? So being MRD yeah, so I took all those slides out because I didn't know how technical to get. So the excitement with venetoclax is that you can clear the marrow. And even more exciting, some of the data coming out of Northwestern, where they've been do in Chicago, where they've been doing the combination of antibody and venetoclax, has have been shown really deep remissions. And in their trial, this is exciting, they allow the really deep remission, people who clear their marrow, get MRD negative, this thing I haven't really talked about, they allow them to stop and then they allow them to restart when required. So venetoclax has this combination for the very deep remissions. One of the reasons we're really excited about it, it could be a drug that clears out your CLL enough to allow you to come off therapy. So last slide, because poor David has got lunch coming and I've talked forever. So I have not covered in any detail MRD, allergenic transplant, the side effects of the new drugs. I just haven't covered that in detail. We haven't really covered the details of NICE approval. There are loads of new drugs in the pipeline, and I thought I was going to click that on. So this came through on Tuesday. Any of you really close stock followers? So that's the stock price of TG Therapeutics going from $5 a share to $10 in one day. And that was all because of a CLL drug. Oblituximab, uh, their new glycosylated antibody, which they've got an early phase trial combining with ibrutinib and showing a doubled up front 
response rate. I'm not doing that as an advert at all. I just thought it's this week showing you how current things are, and that's a watch this space. But there are so many drugs in development for CLL. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting time. Thank you. Thank you.